for months now, people have been protesting in Israel. Mass demonstrations, some of the biggest in the country's 75-year history. It's really scary. It's scary to think of this country possibly going down the road to dictatorship or theocracy or, or some other implausible idea of what might happen. People are angry at the government's radical plans to overhaul the Supreme Court. Many believe these plans will leave the government without checks and balances and will give too much power to the current right-wing coalition, and they're worried. What do you fear is happening? A war. A war for democracy? Yes. And it's not just the size of the protests that's concerning. Strikes are bringing the country to a standstill and threatening its national security, with military reservists refusing to turn up for duty. Things that happened in the past few days uh, are, they, they've never happened before. These protests have divided Israelis deeply over a question that's fundamental to its democracy and what kind of country it will become. I'm Sally Lockwood and this is the Sky News Daily. To help us understand what's going on and just what's at stake, I'm joined by our Middle East correspondent, Ali Bunkle. Well, it kind of dates back in its current form to pretty much the turn of the year when a new government was formed headed by Benjamin Netanyahu, who a lot of people will know, arguably one of the world's best-known politicians, and he became Prime Minister of Israel again for the sixth time, Israel's longest-serving leader. This time, though, he is the head of a coalition government that contains some very extreme right-wing individuals in that. Now, what they're trying to do is change the way that the Supreme Court system works and rebalance the power between the courts and the Knesset, the Israeli parliament. And that has caused a lot of controversy in the country. Just explain, if you can, Ali, what the changes being proposed are and why they're causing so much anger. Well, look, firstly, I can understand that if the prospect of judicial reforms in a foreign country makes you want to turn off or fall asleep. <laughs> that is understandable. <laughs> but actually, when you break it down, what is happening here is incredibly important in a democratic country in the Middle East. But there are kind of three really big ones. The first is that they want the government to have the power to overrule the Supreme Court with just a majority of one vote in the parliament. The second major reform would be that the government would have a greater influence over the appointment of any new judge. They're proposing that they would increase the government representation on the committee that appoints judges. Okay, so the government would be able to effectively appoint the judges who they might feel uh, who are more sympathetic to them. And thirdly, ministers in government ministries would be allowed to appoint their own legal advisers rather than having independent legal advisers. And these reforms are also proposing to weaken the powers of the Supreme Court, as I understand it, Ali. Just explain to us why the Supreme Court is so much of a lightning rod right now. Uh, Israel only has one chamber in the parliament. So where in Britain you've got the House of Commons and the House of Lords, so you've kind of got that upper chamber. Uh, likewise, in Washington, you've got House of Representatives and you've got the Senate. That's not the case in Israel. There's just uh, one house in uh, the Israeli parliament. And you've got a president who is largely ceremonial. And so a lot of people see the Supreme Court as being the only area where you can have checks and balances on what the government do. And that is why they are frightened that if you remove or weaken the power of the Supreme Court, you thus make the government all powerful. And is it right that some see this as a battle for Israel's democracy? Yeah, very much so. I mean, if there are two phrases or words that I've heard over the last few months on the streets of Israel, it is they're eroding our democracy and Benjamin Netanyahu wants to turn into a dictator. Now, of course, Netanyahu and his government completely deny that. They actually believe that what they are trying to do is they are trying to make the country more democratic. Uh, 
the right in Israel are very frustrated. They have been for many years, very frustrated by the power of the Supreme Court and the Attorney General. They think that the courts are left-leaning institutions. They think that they are an unelected elite. And so what they believe they are doing is bringing more power back to the government, back to the parliament. Uh, and they would argue that it is the government who have been democratically elected. So it is therefore the government who should be given the trust and the power to make these decisions. We've seen the Supreme Court rule on very contentious issues in Israel, like Jewish settlements in the West Bank, uh, military service for Orthodox Jews. Tell us more about that. It's a good way of explaining the significance of the Supreme Court's role. And it also ties in with the right wing uh, makeup of this this current government. So uh, to take this government as it is at the moment, you have a number of figures, in particular, uh, the finance minister, a man called Bezalel Smotrich, and the security minister, a man called Itamar Ben-Gavir. Uh, and they are both pretty widely considered here and internationally as being on the extreme right. Bezalel Smotrich, people might have seen in the news recently, was the one who uh, said that Hawara, the Palestinian town, which has been the scene of quite a lot of violence, should be wiped out. And Both those men that I mentioned have a history of wanting to um, increase settlement expansion in the Palestinian West Bank, uh, but also increase Israeli power over Palestinian lives. And so if they are successful in getting these judicial reforms through, the liberal, secular Israelis fear that it will lead to greater Israeli presence in the West Bank, and that then in turn could uh, lead to greater violence between Palestinians and Israelis. A lot of this tension has been mounting over some time, but what we're now seeing is the most right-wing administration in Israeli history, uh, due to Benjamin Netanyahu's latest coalition set up with the conservative right wing. And that is why we're now seeing some of these changes being proposed and consequently, the protests and reaction that we're seeing as well within Israel. Is that right? Indeed. And because of the right wing makeup of the coalition, a lot of Israelis do not trust the government. Netanyahu himself, historically, has been quite a popular politician. I mean, that is why he's managed to become prime minister six times and Israel's longest serving leader. I mean, you don't have that claim to fame if you've not been popular down the years. But people are now starting to change their opinions towards Benny Netanyahu. He has been seen to be beholden to the far right in his coalition. And for a prime minister who has got so much experience at navigating the choppy political waters in Israel, he really seems as though he's boxed himself into a corner on this one. And there is another thing to add about Benjamin Netanyahu in all of this. He is currently on trial for charges of fraud and corruption, which I should say he completely denies. And there is a very wide school of thought here in Israel that the reason that he wants to push through these judicial reforms is to ultimately remove himself from that court process. And so they see him as being self-interested and just wanting greater power and doing this just to save himself further days in court. As you say, he does strenuously deny those charges. I guess the big question is, Ali, what now? By pausing these judicial reforms in the wake of all these protests, is that going to do enough to calm tensions or is that just kicking the can down the road? It is kicking the can down the road. I think two things will happen. Firstly, presents a window for dialogue and potential compromise. Netanyahu says that he's wanted dialogue with the opposition all along. The opposition, though, have remained united despite uh, party political differences and have always said, we will not enter into any dialogue until you pause these reforms and then we can sit around a table and we can try and come to some sort of agreement. Well, that moment is now. So there is time now for the opposition, for the government, and I'm sure there'll be a role to be played by the Israeli president to try and find some compromise, some way forward, which satisfies both sides. However, the protesters, who have a major voice in all of this, as we've seen, uh, 
think that this is a political sleight of hand by Benjamin Netanyahu. And they believe that all he's doing is he's trying to calm the situation, take the sting out of the protests, and in a few weeks' time, he will just start all over again to try and push these reforms through. And it's because of that that they will not stop protesting. I've I've spoken to the protest leaders many times over the last 24 hours or so. They will not stop protesting. I don't think we will see what we saw on Monday when the country just came to a shutdown. It was extraordinary. Remind listeners what happened on, on Monday, Ali. It was almost a general strike in Israel, wasn't it? It was a general strike. Uh, it was because uh, on Sunday night, Benjamin Netanyahu fired his defence minister, a guy called Yov Galant, uh, for speaking out and asking for a pause in the reforms. Because he was seeing what the protests were doing to the operational readiness, to the capabilities of the Israeli military. And the defence minister felt he could take no more and had to speak out. Netanyahu didn't listen. He fired him. And almost immediately, and that is no exaggeration, like within minutes, people started coming out of their homes on a Sunday night onto the streets of Israel, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and other towns and cities up and down the country. And they stayed there throughout Monday, and it built and it built. And Ben Gurion Airport had to pause flights because staff walked out. You had a number of the largest trade unions telling their staff uh, to walk out on strike. That meant that Israeli diplomatic missions, embassies around the world, closed their doors. Major shopping malls closed their doors. The 200 or so McDonald's branches up and down the country stopped serving food. You know, it it just became this widespread general strike. And the pressure came too much on Netanyahu. He locked himself away throughout the day in discussions with his coalition members, trying to make sure that this was not going to result in the collapse of his government. And he eventually came out on national television uh, late into the evening on Monday and announced that he would pause the reforms. It's not just the size of these protests that you say will probably not stop. It's also who is protesting. You know, Israel's Defence Force Reservists, for example. How concerning is this for Israel when it comes to their ability to protect themselves? Hugely concerning. Uh, One of the fabled bomber squadrons that conducts missions you know, quite regularly today uh, over Syria against Iranian targets, in particular operating in Syria. Uh, many of their pilots went out on strike, which, of course, um, reduced the capability of that that squadron. Uh, you had intelligence officers going out on strike. Um, you had infantry officers going out on strike. It was across the board. And I think that it took the government, in particular Netanyahu, really by surprise. The other area that has taken the government by surprise is, a, is, a, is another area that is core to the Israeli uh, society in the way that the military is. And that is the tech sector. Israel is very proud of its uh, tech sector. Uh, There's a lot of technology that we use these days that was developed here, things like the Waze app, for example. And money was starting to seep out of that. They said, look, we're not going to spend any of that money in Israel whilst this goes on. We're not going to hire any jobs there. We're not going to put any investment there because we're worried about what the judicial reforms mean. You know, you're seeing the economic impact with tech leaders saying that they'd pull out of the country. You're saying you're seeing that the security impact in terms of defence force reservists striking. But at the centre of all this, it's the concern about Israeli democracy, Ali. It is. And that is why it is widespread. And I think the power of the protests has lied in two key areas. Firstly, the fact that it is across the board. They can't be dismissed as a small minority group on the left. Actually, Netanyahu described them as an ex- an extreme minority. Uh, they're not. You know, as I said, you've got the tech sector, you've got the military, you've got academics, you've got doctors, you've got lawyers. You know, it is across the board. It is also across the board when it comes to age. You've got young, you've got old. And it is across the board as well when you come to religion. You've got the religious and you've got the secular there. And that gave the protests an awful lot of power. The second thing that gave the protests power is they've remained really very peaceful by and large. There have been arrests. There have been occasions when the police have had to use water cannon. 
or uh, tear gas. But that's been pretty minimal. And I think that has allowed the protesters uh, to keep uh, the upper ground, the moral high ground in all of this. And on top of all these mass protests and strikes within Israel, Ali, we've also seen growing tensions and violence between the Israeli military and Palestinians in recent months. Is there a connection between all this? I wouldn't necessarily draw a direct connection, but everything at the same time here is linked. It is a very small country in many ways. um, And so what goes on in one place has an enormous impact quite often uh, in what goes on elsewhere. Uh, We have seen very, very worrying rising tensions in the West Bank. There are really big fears that the violence could spiral out of control. Um, Already this year, more than 80 Palestinians have been killed. 12 Israelis have lost their lives in terror attacks. The Israeli military are carrying out regular raids into West Bank towns and villages. Um, Often those lead to very violent clashes, uh, gunfights. Civilians have lost their lives as well. And so you have a government fighting battles on two fronts at the moment. The judiciary reforms and the protests that accompany those, but also the security matters in the West Bank. What do you see happening now, Ali? I think we're in very dangerous territory. There has already been warnings of the potential of a civil war here. And so if a compromise path is not established, then the protesters will go back on the streets. Netanyahu will have made it very clear that he is not going to budge. And then you have a standoff. Whether or not there be a civil war, my my personal feeling is, is that I, I can't see that happening. Because at the end of the day, I think Israelis will pull together for the greater good of the country, whatever or however that might present itself. But I do think when you hear senior politicians warn of a civil war, it does make you realise how serious this could get. And I think we could get to a point if the government refuses to give any ground and wants to continue to push through its reforms, I think we very really could get to a point where the protests turn more violent and then who knows where it goes from there. My thanks to Ali Bunkle and to you for listening to the Sky News Daily with me, Sally Lockwood. This episode was produced by Emma Ray Woodhouse. Our editor is Philly Beaumont.